She's getting my division. Really? When did that? It'll be effective in, June, in July. July 1. I'm not. That's good. Small world. Yeah. I, had I, heard, I think I had heard that. Okay, great. All right. So, do you want to put that in your lap so you can still? Sorry, technical stuff. All right, so <coughs> new computer, new stuff. My name is Kathleen Wilbanks. I'm with the California Virtual Campus, which is part of the California Community Colleges. And I'm with ePortfolio California, which is the one specific project that they have. I'm brand new um, to this. I'm not brand new to ePortfolio, so I um, have been studying ePortfolio since 2002, and it was my um, master's thesis was uh, ePortfolio's use and accreditation. And I am also uh, have a paper that's published through Ed Media. Um, I have a, a a Twitter account, this KW underscore ePortfolios, um, if you want to follow me. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting to look at ePortfolios history. Do I just get um, ePortfolios started uh, gaining my uh, interest in 2002 when the California State started talking about um, doing TPEs and TPAs for teacher teacher uh, education. I, I my previous job was with the CSU, California State University. What are TPAs and TPEs? Um, teacher Performance Assessment and Teacher Performance Evaluation. And they wanted, in 2002, mind you, go back in time, um, they wanted to include a half hour of video, uncut video, of the teacher actually teaching something in the classroom. Well, that was, remember 2002, that was not really an easy way to do that. So ePortfolios were uh, tasking the live text for the two that were mainly used back then. And they had the ability to, to have um, different assets within the repository of sorts, and that could include video. 2002 was one of the um, years that California budget was, ha we were having problems with the budget. Nothing compared to now, but 2002 was one of the first dips, if any of you remember it. And it was also when um, the dot-com bubble burst. And so a lot was going on in 2002. So looking at ePortfolios and studying, uh, a, doing a project for all 23 campuses within the CSU for teacher education use in ePortfolios e was, was one of the projects that I worked on back then. So since then, I've seen portfolios develop and take off. And I'll, I'll tell you more about what's happening um, uh, statewide nationally and then worldwide a little bit later. So have, how many, have any of you used ePortfolios at all in your classes and what, what are you doing with them? Um, basically, using my students to start building that as a resume and as a reference as they start going through some of their research projects they're doing as well as some of their hands-on projects so if they have that for later on as they go out the end of the so, so primarily for workforce development, mm -hmm. right? And what? So what? Um, it sounds like you're doing something technical. Yeah, we teach. Uh, we've got four different paths: web development, the uh, and networking communications, which is the Cisco track, and uh, Microsoft. So he should really be giving this presentation because <laughs> you know. Um, anybody else? Yeah, more or less, I guess. But I look at what. Um, our LMS is uh, uh, Angel. Yeah, they have an ePortfolio. They do. They do have that. And I personally didn't like that. I don't think I need it all and trying to use it. Uh, with my students that I'm working with, uh, having them build an informal portfolio, basically, I, I then based them on a blog. And yes. they can uh, add in all their pictures and graphics and, and different kinds of things showcasing what they can do. Yeah. So it's more of a uh, build it yourself right for them as opposed to something. Blogs and wikis are, are, are really popular for use of ePortfolios. 
And what, what are you using? What products are you using in the middle of the wiki? And they also have a portfolio plugin for Google now that yeah. we're starting to experiment with. Right. Yes. Uh, our local school district community college. Are you looking at it as a part of your credit function program? What college? I'm sorry. Uh, our school district is local community college. as part of a dual credit program. So, so high school classes and will will be credited for college. Right, but for new credits, it's uh, a dual credit situation. It has to come out of course, right. course tests or evaluation. So right. Oh, Absolutely. And, and where are you from? Uh, that's Tennessee. Okay, in Tennessee. Great, great. So, th so you've heard three different examples of what people are using. And 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 what product are you using, did you say? They, they, they have just gone through the politics. Yes. Which is the hardest part. The politics are the hardest part. Because let me tell you, students are doing this anyway. Students are keeping their work anyway. And ha how they put it together for presentation purposes, for workforce development or how they pull together things to show that they've made significant changes during the class time um, are all, they're saving their stuff. And, and I think higher ed institutions, community colleges, um, certificate programs, whatever, I think one of our jobs is to show them to have critical thinking and be mindful of what their presence is. Some people use this, the, terminal, the term that Facebook is for fun and ePortfolios is for professional. And, um, and I kind of like that because I think that, um, that kids, sometimes kids, I say kids, I don't mean, you know, uh, there, sometimes there is a problem in differentiating between what you really want the public to see and what you're showing the public. And they don't uh, always understand that if it's out there for a day, it can be out there forever because all it is is a screen capture. And I think, um, uh, you know, helping them in workforce development, helping them to show their, their professional face is very important. So, so you've heard three stories. Anybody else with any portfolio stories? Okay. So we can, we can slide on to the next one. So as you all know, um, paper e-portfolios have been used for a long time in our paper portfolios have been used for a long time in things like art or even engineering. Um, there are some disciplines that just take to portfolios naturally um, or historically rather. And, and in electronic portfolios, I do see that those types of disciplines adopt an electronic portfolio pretty quickly. Um, there's e-folio thinking is, is the term that's going around now. And that's how do, you, how do you take something that has not traditionally maybe used a portfolio and think about how it would be um, brought over. And, and I think there's also, I'll just go out on a limb here, I think there's also certain disciplines that take to it a little bit, a little bit easier. And we can talk about that a little later. So um, the next slide is, um, Oh, this is really bad because the light coming in. I, <laughs> can you guys even see that? This is a poster that I that I developed a few years ago, and it's <clears throat> the center of the poster. Because I've studied e-portfolios for a long time, I've seen some really bad uses of e-portfolios. Thank you. That that helps a lot. Um, <laughs> when when it and when an e-portfolio is. Um, institutionally centered, it doesn't necessarily work. So I, I, my own philosophy is that any portfolio should be student centered and uh, it should be by and for the students and it should be for lifelong learning and it should be owned by the students. And that's, that's where we get, uh, probably going to get in trouble because this is being recorded, but that's where we get into a little bit of tension, in, in my mind, between the angel model or the blackboard model or what have you, because those, those are institutional uh, um, systems that when the student leaves, most of us don't have the ability to finance letting those students keep an account. And, you know, I was at a panel presentation by students who had built e-portfolios using Blackboard, and it was a senior project, and they were all so proud of their portfolios, and they were going out, and and excited to be using them as a 
you know, having a traditional resume but then a link to their por to their portfolio. And they found out during the presentation because somebody from the audience asked, so what happens when these students graduate and leave? And that's when they found out that, well, we don't really know. <laughs> and so you saw four students very upset because they had worked so hard on their e-portfolios. Um, which is another pedagogical thing. I think, I think that the sooner you give students an e-portfolio tool, the sooner they'll start using it and realize that it's for them. And they'll use it whether you push them to use it or not because they'll store things on it and, and depending on how you do it. But again, a worst case scenario, I have a friend who got her, her um, master's in library sciences from a, a close by institution and um, the last semester of her master's, she was told she had to put together a new portfolio. She had one class, the last class, the, the culminating class was putting together the e-portfolio. That's not how an e-portfolio should be. It should be growing with you as you go on. And, and that's, she hates e-portfolios. She, she doesn't even want to hear about an e-portfolio. She will, she literally, if, if this had been a binary portfolio, she would have been over at the bonfire burning the e-portfolio, you know. So um, that's a real, real sad case. So they should be student-centered. Um, many of them are repository models where the students can go in and put their stuff on, uh, it, 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 I like to visualize a bookshelf. So, so they, they do a project, they come and they put it on the bookshelf and they put that project on the bookshelf. And then, and then they, 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 are, they have maybe photos, a resume, report card, reports, whatever, a lab project saved in this repository, and then they select and pull down items to build specific websites or presentation portfolios for whomever, be it um, a prospective employer, their parents, or their friends. So let's say, um, you know, John has, you know, went on a ski weekend over the break and has all these pictures of, of being at the cabin with his friend, frat house. And he also got an award for volunteering at the um, cancer camp for kids. And he also got a pretty good grade on one of these papers that he did. And, um, and then he, he's done some other volunteer experience and he wants to put together a resume for, for um, applying for a job. All of those assets are in the repository, but he pulls down specific ones and then allows the selective audience to look at that presentation. So he certainly does not want his mom to see the pictures of the frat house party at the top, right? And he doesn't want the employer, to, prospective employer, to see them. Um, but the frat house doesn't really want to see his, his certificate for volunteering at the camp of camp for kids. So he, so he gets to build a specific um, base for each of these audiences. But all of his stuff is still on the, in the, on the bookshelf. That's, that's a quick description of the new portfolio from, um, if, if you're using a repository model. Now, we heard about blogs. Blogs wouldn't be like that. Blogs are uh, a one-stop shop. And, that, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay, too. But they're not going to have that flexibility. Uh, now, on this side, again, I apologize for it's such a light, the light is just not working very well. On this side, I've uh, built a little model of what, what can be in it for the rest of the audience. The so faculty, the institution, um, the school maybe. And depending on how, what tool you're using, <coughs> what vendor tool you're using, and how much time you spend on the back end, you can really build the model for e-portfolios to um, attend to a lot of needs. So for accreditation purposes, you can, if you build a model that you, you're going to go out and collect all of um, Psychology 101's third paper, um, third assignment, so that the accreditation agencies can witness those. Um, you, you have to do it in a certain way on the back end of the portfolio tool. And um, institutional departments, classes, and it, and it goes all the way down to assignments. And I have another um, um, slide that I'll show you that, that can look like that a little bit better. 
Okay, next slide. So <coughs> you can use um, portfolios uh, in a variety of ways, but uh, here's uh, resumes, established program standards, encourage self-reflection, employee, employer and staff feedback, and then across the portfolios, remember on the poster, that right side, across portfolios, you can evaluate program impact and assess factors leading to success. So there's, there's almost two um, schools of thought. And um, can you go to the next slide? <coughs> and then we have, we have um, benefits for students, faculty, and institutions, which I've kind of covered, so we'll go to the next slide. I want to make sure we have time. So again, for e-portfolios for students, um, about you know eight years ago, there's um, there there's a there was a lot of talk about teaching and learning in portfolios and reflection. So e-portfolios became a subject that a lot of people who were really into reflection um, embraced. Um, Helen Barrett, who's a big e-portfolio person, Helen Chen from Stanford, um, Tracy Pennylight from um, Back East. Um, they all really liked the reflection part. So, so students put, put on their bookshelf all these assignments. And then let's say he has to, again, for the professor from philosophy, or, um, Psychology 101 says, pick two assignments. And I want you to write a piece uh, reflecting on them and what you learned off of them. Or, or even for a, um, you know, masters, you have to do a, a reflection of all uh, of the, all the work you've done. So some people really like e-portfolios for the reflection part. I my previous life was in banking and um, 20 years in banking, private industry, and I worked with a lot of the um, auditors. And when the auditors Fortunately, I got to work with a bank that was brand new. I was a 13th employee, and we grew to be 250 employees. And mergers and acquisitions took care of that. But um, we, we got to work with the auditors right from the get-go and say, what do you want? And technology had gotten to a point where we could, we could have technology do a lot of the collection. But when I came into um, the CSU and saw what people went through for their, for their accreditation purposes, I was astounded because I saw um, <clears throat> some of the best professors pulled off of teaching in order to work for two years on getting ready for accreditation. And I said, wow, is it a surprise? No, we know for years it's coming. Wow, that you wait. Why do you do this? <laughs> well, this is the way we've always done it. Well, don't you know what they're going to collect? Yes, we do. Why is this done electronically? I, 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 you know, I'm just stunned because I, I also, you know, being in business, look at the return on investment and the cost analysis and say, you, you're taking a, you know, one of the top professors out of teaching for two years. You have to hire somebody else. You're taking um, other staff that's good at what they do off of what they normally do to put them on the accreditation team. You have to hire in a lecturer. Um, you have to hire in temporary staff to take care of the, the, the office work. Where, where is this money coming from? Oh, it's the cost of business. Well, um, there's also the underlying, and I've seen this myself with my middle child who's um, taking classes and his senior professor, he's in his senior year, and the senior professor um, was pulled off and um, is working on accreditation. So he's never going to get to learn from that professor. He's, it's his senior year. He's missed out on the reason he went to that school. Um, so, it's, so it just seems like there could be a lot more planning and, and mindfulness. So, so here's, here's for students, you can, they, um, you can reflect, you can share, you can collect, you can evaluate. So collect, reflect, and evaluate are, are you, you hear those three often used with e-portfolios. So um, next slide, thanks. So for faculty, um, and I have a little um, chart a little bit later, um, that these, these bullet points come from both um, um, talking directly to faculty who have used, used uh, e-portfolios in their classes and, and faculty who are getting ready to use it. So some of this is, is 
you know, speculative and some of it's proven. And again, I'll show you uh, the results of a, of a survey that we did. So um, increasing achievement, helping with assessment, these are, these are benefits for faculty. Next one. So this is the survey we did. This is um, survey was done in spring 2009. The ePortfolio California is through the California Community Colleges, the, um, um, California Virtual Campus, and there we currently have first year program with um, 23 different campus um, sites, and not not just community colleges, but K-12. Uh, community colleges, UCs, and CSUs within this. And we surveyed, this is in a year, we're doing 50 different um, classes. Uh, the faculty set, these are faculty who have used this, and they said it improves their assessment of student work, provides feedback, and allows for peer feedback, and uh, makes learning more visible and increases student engagement. This is their reports on, on what happening with uh, with their use of the portfolio and then increasing 21st century skills which is the ICT stuff right that's the that's the gold one in the middle that was the that was the, the highest ranked um, asset to, to uh, go ahead yes. so in portfolios for institutions I talked to you before about accreditation we can skip on <coughs> and this is um, this was developed at San Francisco State University. Uh, they've been, they're part of the pilot program. They've been using ePortfolios in a variety of disciplines for a couple of years now. And they're, um, they're really a, um, a campus to watch. I think they're, they're doing some great things. So when you talk about competencies, you have, to, you, you have your goals. And, and I, I tried to look at ICT competencies on Google. And it's, man, <laughs> it, it's everything, right? I mean, um, from kind of knowing how to turn on a computer to using your basic software package, you know, it just kind of goes up and up and up. So I think, I know this presentation is ICT competencies, but I couldn't get a list that anybody would agree on. So we'll just make it a vague thing. But for electronic portfolios, um, you have institutional goals and objectives college goals, department goals, class objectives, and artifacts. So it pushes down to being a specific assignment. And, and that, again, going back to that poster on that far right side, you have to get it down to a specific. And then you're all technology, you know. You know that then you can pull it, you know, is database driven. So if something goes into, the database here, you can pull that, right? So having breaking things down. Now this is where <laughs> this is where I find um, institutions, departments have some issues. I was I was facilitating a department's use of e-portfolios, and we were talking about competencies and requirements and um, sitting the people in a in a, in, in a room and just talking about who's doing what. And there, there was almost a fist fight because, you know, Joe over here says, well, I've been doing that for years in my class. And, you know, Susan over here is saying, no, no, I've been doing that since 1988, you know. And, and when you start having those discussions, they're not about e-portfolio. They're about how the department's being run and who's doing what. But E-portfolio tends to take the brunt of it, <laughs> you know. I, they, they, Susan and Joe are both leaving saying, I hate e-portfolios, and it has nothing to do with e-portfolios. So knowing what the goal is, and today I went, um, earlier this morning I attended a, um, a presentation by Steve Wright. Did, I don't know if any of you went to that, but he was saying that he had, um, he works with community colleges now too, new like me, and he had a survey done of, uh, you know, there are 111 community colleges in California. There are over 400 multimedia degrees or certifications you can get within those 111 campuses. And he says, how can you go out and, and, and promote your students 
who take multimedia when you have 400 different products and how there's a gap between the competencies. You, you can't have 400 di different certificates and degrees and have consistency and competency. So when you go out and talk to the legislature about your um, programs, um, it's, it's kind of a mishmash. mishmash. <laughs> so, w you know, he brought up competencies and the consistency of competencies. And when you look at this, you can see that if, if you want to, you can um, push out a, a program to each campus that would, that would have to do with the competencies, building off of cons consistent competencies. For, we're not saying how to do it, we're just saying that these are the competencies. Here's the ePortfolio template that we want people to fill out and assure that there is some consistency in that. So I, I thought it was interesting how that tied in. Okay, we can go on. Um, back in February, we had a day of dialogue at Westfield Center at San Francisco State's downtown uh, campus, which is where you are all at this morning. And, um, and we recorded everything, video recorded everything, and then we archived it on this website. And within this, um, you can watch a very good presentation by Kevin Kelly, and he talks about mapping, that thing that you just saw where you take the goals and break them down into an artifact or, a, or a, an assignment. And um, I do not see the URL here, but it's on my card. Um, and Kevin and some of the state in general has agreed to um, allow all of their documents to be here for you to download. So there's the mapping portfolio documents as a PDF, case studies is a doc, and um, exercise and workshop and worksheets are docs. And um, you can go on this site and watch the video and, um, and download those, those documents and have a workshop at your own institution. These are my cards, and I apologize. They're printed at home, and my printer didn't like the card stock, so they're a little bit off. Uh, but on the back is the value. <laughs> on the back are the, um, the resources that, I, that I'm referring to today. So um, I highly recommend you go look at that website. That's the, um, that's the Teaching Commons website. It starts with Teaching Commons, so you might want to mark that on the back there. So we can just a question about these resources. So the very first one you had mentioned already, Portfolio California. Yes. Is that, just describe that a little bit more? Yeah, that's the project that I'm new to, that I'm working with. Um, it's been around for about a year, a little bit longer. And the first year um, concentrated on um, getting a, a couple of uh, vendor products out to different different constituents from K-12, um, K-12 community colleges, CSUs, and UCs. And then um, we're entering the next phase where we're going to go out and, and see what they're actually accomplishing with them, who's using them. Um, remember earlier I was saying there's some disciplines that that tend to take right. to them. So I'm anxious to see how that how that was not a study. That was my <laughs> my um, own thoughts of how it's going. So I'm anxious to see how the study is going to go. So ePortfolio California, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later too. So we have um, 23 different different uh, locations. Can you even see that that's a map of California? Not so much. <laughs> it looks really good on my computer. I don't know. I, you know, it, it, it. so um, yeah. This is when California fell off of the rest of the world. And, yeah. So we're here now. Um, okay. So uh, I just have a quick follow-up on sure. the vendor products. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> You won't be able to squeeze for them. You mentioned that issue about cost, right? So are these are these products that are uh, cost tested and whether they're free or not? Uh, Portfolio California negotiated with um, with two vendors, and and at at this time they're five dollars a person um, a year, not lifelong. Um, as you heard earlier, there's different things you can use 
and um, including blogs, bloggers for you right now. Um, that, that's not a repository model. That's not a lifelong repository where they, they're going to be able to get it. Um, Google Docs, Helen Barrett, um, who I do not have her site on here. Um, I think it's www.eportfolio.org. I'm not sure. Uh, if, you, if you Google Helen Barrett, she has tons and tons of information up on her website, and it's really an ugly website. But the information is really good. <laughs> There's a mic up here that I keep covering. Um, um, she's really good, and she, because she talks about the Google Docs thing. Now, again, on Google Docs, um, you can achieve that left side of that of that poster with the students and the students being able to pick things and then make a Google site out of it. But you won't have the right site, that faculty uh, institutional support in terms of a database model where you can pull things out of. Um, we we talked. Somebody has talked to. I, I say we. When I say we, sometimes I mean the e-portfolio people of the of the <laughs> world. Um, I think you know talks with Google in terms of trying to develop something that can be Google-based, so that the students can have it lifelong, and then allowing the institution to go in and gather data would be really nice. But it's not there yet. So let me explain. So. LaGuardia in New York has gotten Gypsy grants and a lot of money in Gypsy grants, like millions of dollars in Gypsy grants. And they have been using portfolios in LaGuardia, which is anybody from LaGuardia? That would be amazing. Um, they did a study, this is a 2005, so, th so they've been using it for a while. And, um, not that you can read this, but each section is a different group of classes, and they talked about the left side of each section is the group that didn't use ePortfolios, and the right side is the group that did. So these are course tax rates. So you can see that ePortfolios contributed to kids passing the classes. So San Francisco State's doing some great stuff. Um, LaGuardia is doing some great stuff. So we can move on. Um, I'm going to talk about that. Okay, um, internationally, uh, Scotland, Ireland, um, New Zealand, Australia, um, Hong Kong, I think, um, Singapore, are all ahead of us, ahead of the United States in general with using e-portfolios. Um, they, many of them, they, uh, England has. It's a nationwide project, Scotland, too. Um, and there's a, learn, there's a learning forum in London in 2010. Um, if the cost of flights keep coming down, I think I'm going to go. <laughs> um, so, uh, but there's, there's stuff happening. And, and I, I was at Ed Media um, earlier this summer, and, and the international interest in ePortfolios is just incredible. Um, so we can, can, we can move on. Then we have um, nationally, and AAEEBL is um, Association for Aesthetic, Experiential, and Evidence-Based Learning. This goes back to, and, and there, there are new e-portfolio groups. Remember when I told you that there's a group that believes in the reflection part, and I'm kind of more of the accreditation <laughs> and lifelong learning and workforce development part. This, these guys are all, all my friends who we have heated discussions because uh, well, not so much anymore. I used to be the only one talking about accreditation and lifelong learning and workforce development. But they're, they're coming on board. So, um, so that is, they're having a conference in Boston that's associated with the campus technology uh, conference as well. So, so it's gaining momentum nationally. And then uh, there's also EPAF, which is on the back of your thing. That's uh, um, Helen Chen and John Edelson are EPAF um, folks. And, um, and, and they do a lot of work. They're having a webcast something. 
you can go online or you can just listen to it um, through the telephone bridge next week on the 13th and the 14th. So if you go to that, um, her website, you'll see it there. And it's on um, ePortfolios in Workforce Development. And she has somebody from the United States talking about an institution from the United States talking about how they're using ePortfolios for helping their students find jobs. Maybe it's somebody from your institution, I don't know. Um, and somebody from Canada or, or London maybe. So the 13th and 14th, um, and that is the middle resource, the epac.pbworks.com. That should that should be up. The announcement should be up there now. So I, I highly recommend you do that. I think they're at 11 West Coast time. Then this site, this is INEC, uh, uh, EPAC International. This is um, International National Coalition for ePortfolio Research. And again, I apologize for this. Um, this group has grant money, and they have. Cohorts and there's cohort one, cohort two, cohort three, cohort four, and cohort five. And they started in 2002. Cohort one was pretty much the United States folks, and then two, three, four for sure was all like UK and uh, New Zealand and all that um, that cohort. But the fifth cohort, the newest cohort, is mostly um, is all from America. And it includes like Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania State has a new um, uh, uh, project for ePortfolios used statewide. Um, Minnesota has one. They've had one for a while. Um, so, so ePortfolios are gaining again in in uh, popularity and discussion. And I think part of it is because of the acc accreditation and. Um, institutional assessments and tying things to specific um, models of proof, you know, uh, that we're seeing right now. Um, of course, I like Helen Barrett has a, has a saying that says, just because we can, should we, I, it, which I kind of like because I always worry that we're slicing and dicing just a little too much sometimes. So. Um, so this is, going forward, this is just ePortfolio California, the project that I'm new to. Um, we are going to evaluate what we've learned. We are looking into interoperability. So this uh, is currently a little bit of a question as to when students save things uh, in that repository model, can they then pull it and take, take it and plug it in elsewhere? So, for instance, if you have Blackboard and you have the ePortfolio model in Blackboard and you have students who have been storing their stuff in their Blackboard ePortfolio and now they're graduating, can they in fact take all that stuff off on a flash drive and go over and say to TaskStream, I want to start paying for TaskStream now, um, plug and there's all my stuff, yes, I'm going to pay you $60 a year and have my portfolio. It, it, it's not happening right now. Um, so this is PESC. Is, is anybody familiar with PESC? Yes. Is there a file format? No. Uh, most of them are um, whatever, they support whatever format you have. Is, is there an MP5 now? MP3, now there's MP5. Yeah, I've, I've heard there's MP5. Well, maybe, anyway, so I, I just heard this morning on my little iPhone, there's a little, we're doing some evaluation of some of the vendor tools, and, and we found that one of them doesn't, doesn't do MP3s, which is, how can you not do MP3s? But, but, you know, I say that so cavalierly, but really, that stuff's changing all the time, you know, and how do you plug in from here and unplug and plug in there and know it's going to, you know, it's, it's quite a thing. So. Um, and then, and then there's the dated stuff. You know, you say something. I have, um, and this might be why it's doing this. I have Windows 7. That's what I developed this on. Windows 7. Well, I don't know that this is Windows 7. Maybe, maybe that's part of the problem. You know. Mm -hmm. um, 
They're perfectly on here. Are they? Oh, it's, you know, I was at another conference where people who use these computers, these computers don't have the power to, to um, put, the, put the slides up perfectly. That's, you know, I don't know. That's what I've heard. So you should all know that they're rendering perfectly here. The slides are around. Um, then sharing resources, we, we want to build our website out to have um, uh, teaching and learning documentation, accreditation documentation, workforce development documentation, or, or at least via referatory, refer people to um, best practices at um, Pennsylvania or, uh, you know, sharing. Um, definitely. The Eportfolio community tends to be a sharing community anyway. Um, so legislative reporting, um, you know, my dream has been to have a model like um, like Minnesota with their e-folio model or Pennsylvania. Um, Minnesota took some money, uh, got grants from the state years ago, workforce development grants, and they built um, e-folio, uh, which is now Xfolio. But uh, theirs was a template-based model. So uh, they could push out templates that then got filled in. They linked it to workforce development funds because they could foresee intersecting it with the unemployment or what's it called now, employment development department. So if you had somebody who was getting their certifications in HVAC, um, you would have the four or five different certification buckets that they could, you know, if, if Joe Smith went on and put in three of the five certificates and then, um, you know, registered as unemployed, they would mash him up and say, Joe, there are no jobs here, but an hour away is this job and we'd like you to go apply to that. So it's, uh, they, they could foresee that in their state, Minnesota has pretty high unemployment because it's cold there. No, it, it's <laughs> sorry. Just thinking you guys are awake. Um, they have an they have um, traveling unemployment for some reason in that state. They have they have areas that will have no jobs, and then another area that's really hot. So, so having this ability to match is really important. Their their model was. Uh, was the state pays the higher ed system to maintain the e-portfolios for everyone in the state. So when you're in fifth grade, you get your e-portfolio that state maintained. So then you can do longitudinal studies later and see what happened over the Yes. Yes. Exactly. It really takes a lot of coordination on the part of the institution and your faculty because Otherwise, I mean, if the students just pick and choose, they have a neglected mixture of, of nothing, you know, that a future employer would care to look at because it means nothing. A student doesn't know how to pull together the right kind of material that will be, that will help them to get a right. job or get into a college or whatever. Right. And so many of our assignments are, you know, do this out of the back of the book and do this out of chapter three. Those things do not make good material for us. No. They don't make assets. No. So, right. so you have to really train your faculty to know how to build assignments that will right. go into a book. This is e-folio thinking. And it, and it does, it, you know, you can, you can look at a lot of different pieces of e-portfolios. And this is one that, that is, that is fascinating to me because um, I have three kids in college and when they tell me stories about certain classes, I think, well, why, why didn't they just do this online? <laughs> you know, and then there's classes that really do uh, engender critical thinking. But it, it, you're right. If you say uh, the kids, you know, pull together stuff and can go present it anywhere. Going back to the model that they get it young, or they get it early, or, or you know they get it, you know they're, they're entering as freshmen and they get their their login to their student site and they get 
three, four, four at the same time. Each each time, each class they use that in is an opportunity to teach them what what shows their growth or what shows their accomplishments. Um, and that is our job. And and I think that's our job with or without a portfolio. And and getting them to get a job. It's, everybody works. Well, almost everybody I know works. And um, and I I'm also the Sonoma County Board of Education. Um, I'm a trustee for the Sonoma County Board of Education, so I, I have K-12 interests as well. And when I put on my K-12 hat, and then I put on my community college hat, and remember I used to wear a CSU hat, and hear all this stuff about, um, you know, we don't want to teach them workforce development. We'll get into trouble because they're not going to go into the workforce. They're going to go into college. Well, they're going to go into the workforce eventually. And the sooner you kind of teach them how to have that critical thinking and how to present themselves professionally, the better off they're going to be. And, and maybe they're going right into college, but maybe they're going to need an internship right away or, you know, what have you. It's our job to teach them that. And I don't think it's our job. Oh, I think that. Yes. Yeah, I just have a street comment, which is one. I've done this with panels. I'll ask them. Of what are the characteristics of good learning? And they'll list all the characteristics of good learning. And then you can put, then you put down next to it, you know, what are the kind of personal skills you need to succeed in your funding? And they're the same. So it's really, I mean, I, I, I guess I reject the idea that by providing workplace kinds of skills or yeah, no. But those aren't things that lead to success in college. I, I agree with you. And I think <coughs> that um, when we hear about, again, there's that divide. There, there should not be any divide. Um, they should still be doing critical thinking of, of their own work and, and reflecting on their own work and getting ready and, and coming on time and <laughs> dressing nice and brushing their teeth and, you know, being ready and, and listening to instruction. So. Um, I don't know where, where, what happened when, but <laughs> something happened to get us to divide those. those. One, one epiphany I had at one time was that a lot of us don't believe we're part of the workforce. Oh, that was so strong. <laughs> so it's that book that, that do what you love and the money will follow, yes. right? Yeah. Are there privacy issues? Yeah, there are, yeah, there are privacy issues um, in terms of now. Remember, if 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 you have 18 or over, what they put out on the web is their business. But their privacy issues with K-12, um, and there are there are ways to to do that. Efolio or Exfolio from Minnesota has that pretty well down because they they do offer this. You get it, you know, if, if you live and breathe. It, in Minnesota, you get an e portfolio. So they have. Um, but I would think as an adult, I want to be able to control who has access. To right. Well, that's right. The, the poster that I showed you down at the bottom was secure and selective access. So that repository part is private. And then you pull selected stuff, build a site, and then you can invite people to look at it or make it open. So the owner has exclusive control? Depending on the vendor product. Depending on, on a blog, what, what depends on what blog, you know, some blog things have a password protected thing. So it, it really depends on what you're using. They, you know, these portfolios is a, in here is kind of a philosophy, right? So next one. Yeah, and these are this, uh, um, the references that again are on the back of the card. Yes. I really enjoy your presentation, but every Thank time you. I hear the portfolio presentation, I still don't know how to do it, what's really in it, from the relevance of the industry. You talked about all the benefits of it. Yes. But it's still very amorphous to me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am, but my school's in Blackboard, and I'm going to be able to talk about this. I think that it's more um, 